In the late 1800s, a deadly phenomenon was occurring in America. Fire departments were beginning to use these large safety nets that resembled these huge circular stretches of canvas to try to save people that were stuck in burning buildings. During a multi-story fire, these firefighters would show up and they would get out this big net and they would all take up positions around it, holding onto the edges, and then they would move it directly underneath one of the windows of the burning oh, building, no. and then they would call out to the people inside to jump out of the window onto the net and then there's there's no way that actually like, there's no way like off mr deeds when they jumped the firefighters would make sure to maneuver the net to try to catch the person right in the middle breaking their fall and saving their lives however the deadly phenomenon was that these people who were stuck in these buildings were more afraid to make the jump onto the net than they were of the fire and so despite the fire how how would they so they would prefer to be burnt alive than to die from a fall what come on firefighters constant urges to please just jump <clears throat> they would stay put and they would die in the fire and so fire departments all fuck? over america were desperately trying to find ways to educate the american public about the <clears throat> relative safety of these nets that certainly making this jump is a better bet than staying in an actively burning building but to okay i know what happens i know exactly what happens they're going to do a demonstration and it's not going to work, and then everyone's going to watch someone die. That's what's going to happen. There's no way. That, Despite their efforts, Americans were up. still staying put in these buildings and dying unnecessarily. Yeah, it's a new video. In 1883, which was around the time of this deadly phenomenon, a diving instructor working out of Washington, D.C., named Robert Odlum, heard about this issue, and he thought to himself, you know, if Americans just maybe saw someone make the jump successfully, oh, they wouldn't no! be afraid anymore. And since yep. Robert was a diving instructor yep. and so was very comfortable jumping from heights, he thought, well, who better to make make these demonstrations than me. And so in collaboration with several Washington DC fire departments, Robert began hosting these demonstrations where he would leap out of multi-story buildings onto the safety net. And very quickly, these demonstrations began attracting very big crowds, but not because they wanted the education of the event. They just- They were hoping he would die. Let's be real. There's some weird fucked up thing when it comes to humans where we want to watch a car crash we want to see chaos and mayhem you know what i mean like like when you're when people watch nascar in races they just want to watch someone crash you know they just want to watch someone burn like crash and burn and potentially die they like a lot of times NASCAR watchers don't watch. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of them probably watch loud noises and vroom vroom and they turn left, but also but the potential that someone could, could crash. Yeah. Morbid curiosity. My mass media teacher would watch people hit by car compilations on the TV with what the fuck? Yeah. Like dude, if you look up car crash videos, the views on them are insane. We do live in a society. Just wanted Good to see teacher. someone jump out of a building onto a net. It was like a circus act. And Robert, who was not <laughs> expecting this to happen, found himself really enjoying the attention he was garnering. And so pretty quickly, he stopped doing demonstrations to... He's gonna, he's gonna make, um, he's gonna go higher. He's gonna up the ante. He's gonna go higher and higher and higher until he dies. Show off fire net safety and instead began jumping off of huge bridges into bodies of water just because people thought oh. it was awesome. He was becoming this celebrity in Washington, D.C. And soon Robert began taking what do you mean, his potentially? show they all absolutely over the country, basically to touring sure. to all these bridges all over America. They love toying with mortality. The city, encouraging people to show up to the bridge on the day of his jump. And then when he would get to the bridge, there'd be hundreds and hundreds of people cheering him on. But Robert's very unlikely 
quickly and rapid rise to fame and fortune quickly spawned copycats. And in 1885, so two years after Robert oh. had begun this okay, this took venture, a turn. his popularity was beginning to wane because he was no longer as unique. Before, it was really just him doing these jumps, and now he was kind oh, of a commodity. Oh, he's so gonna do, he's gonna be like the one magician who tried to beat Houdini. Oh no, he's gonna do that. You guys remember that? The dude who tried to beat Houdini and then covered himself in concrete? <laughs> he thought he could get out? Like, it's, it's that. It's that all over again. So feeling desperate to become relevant again, Robert thought to himself, you know, I gotta do something that sets me apart from all the other bridge jumpers. I gotta do something that nobody else has done. That way I can that once mustache. again become the bridge jumper. And it just so happened there was a bridge that had recently been constructed in New York called the Brooklyn. Yo, $25 from the Crimson Alchemist. The bid is going up. Brooklyn bridge that the auction was maintained. massive. It spanned 1,600 feet from Brooklyn across the East River to New York City, and at its highest point, it was a whopping 130 feet off of oh the water. Oh my God! And so if Robert made that jump, he would actually set the record for the highest bridge jump ever. But by this point, uh, bridge jumping had become popular enough that police had caught on to it, and they had made from sugar bubble gum. Let's go! It illegal, mostly to protect the bridge jumpers from themselves, and so any time police saw advertisements for an upcoming bridge jump, they would show up to the location on the day of the jump in force and they would stop the jumper from jumping. And so Robert knew this, but he still needed to get the word out about this big Brooklyn Bridge jump. And so he created a very clever word of mouth campaign amongst- Okay, isn't the Brooklyn Bridge like famous for suicides? Is that what I'm thinking of? What Which bridge is like famous for suicides? Yes? Is it that one? There's the Golden Gate. Amongst us? It's the Golden Gate? Okay, I think I was mixing them up people in New York, and he also began handing out these flyers that were fairly cryptic, but still told people where to go and at what time for this big spectacle they were going to see. And on May 19th of that year, the day of the jump, Robert's underground advertising campaign had worked beautifully. By early that morning, the Brooklyn Bridge was covered with hundreds and hundreds of people, also down on the banks as well. There's all these people who are all waiting to see Robert make this record-setting jump. Maybe Robert he'll die this time. Let's go. Since he began doing these bridge jumps and he had developed a sort of trademark entrance but really any big bridge a has a lot of suicides and, True. and then once it stopped on the bridge he would leap out and he'd be wearing this long coat and he would take oh! it off revealing his swimsuit <laughs> and the crowd oh! would cheer and then he would wave i just imagine him in like a top hat in a swimsuit oh i have arrived oh your your entertainment is here yes to the crowd and then he would just run to the edge and leap off the bridge oh, yes, and so on may 19th die. all these people who are waiting for robert they're looking for this black horse and carriage and around noontime someone spotted it it was coming onto the bridge from the brooklyn side and then once it stopped on the bridge the door flung open and robert leapt out in his big coat he ripped his coat off revealing his swimsuit the crowd oh i thought he was gonna be naked oh crowd was going wild. Everyone was so pumped about this. He's yeah, waving and getting so ready. He starts running death. to the railing to make this jump. And before he jumps, the police swarm him and arrest him. The police were not dumb. They had caught on to this underground advertising campaign. And so like everyone else, they were out in force on this bridge. There were all these officers everywhere. And so as soon as they saw the Did we get baited? This carriage, they immediately rushed over, intercepted it, and they stopped him. And so as they're arresting Robert, the crowd is starting to boo, and they're chanting, let him jump, let him jump. And the police, who are all kind of gathered on the Brooklyn side of the bridge, they're telling people to start to disperse. And as they're doing this, something incredible happens. On the far other side of the bridge, on the New York side of the bridge, another black horse and carriage had just come to a stop on the bridge. The doors had flung open, and a man had jumped out wearing a long coat he had ripped it off revealing a swimsuit and the crowd went wild oh! it was the real robert odlum the oh! man the police oh oh shit dude oh double debate 
It was, oh my God, double debate. ...had arrested was actually an actor that Robert had paid to pretend to be him. Robert had told him to show up at a particular time and make the typical entrance that he would in order to suck all the police it was to an that imposter. side of the bridge. And then while that was happening, Robert would show up and have enough time and space to make the jump. And his plan had worked perfectly. And so the police who are on the Brooklyn side, they see this happening and they realize there's no way they can run all the way across the bridge and stop robert before he makes the jump and so like everyone else they just kind of when the jumper the is and they watched and so the real robert after revealing his swimsuit he waved to the crowd he's smiling everyone's going crazy and he runs over to the railing he climbs onto the other side and he's looking out over the water and he gives one more wave to everyone down below in boats and on the banks and on the sides of the bridge and everyone's going crazy and then he jumps. Onlookers would later say that at first his jump was perfect. As soon as he leapt off the bridge, like he always did, he put his right arm straight over his head and he tucked his left arm by his side. Ooh, this allowed him to stay in an upright vertical Thank you, discount position Jesus. as he fell. But just a sec- Yeah, by the way, Discount Jesus is uh, uh, the person who made the little brooms and the sign up here. For the, for the auction. And into his fall, a strong gust of wind blew Robert off his axis, and suddenly he was falling on oh! his side. Now, it's important to understand, bridge jumpers, when they jump from really high heights, they need to land feet first in a vertical position. This allows their feet to, quote, break the surface. He belly flopped tension of the water before the rest of their body comes crashing down. And if they do it that way, the water functions much like the firefighter's safety net. It will break the jumper's fall and save their life. But if the jumper lands at basically any other angle, the water tension will not break fast enough before the rest of their body hits the surface of the water. And so the water, instead of functioning like a net that will save them, will actually function like concrete. So after this gust of wind had blown Robert onto his oh, side. No. He began flailing in midair to try to get himself back to his upright vertical position, but he couldn't do it in time, and so he slammed into the water directly on his right side. And when the crowd saw this, they figured something was wrong, but they didn't really know, oh. and so everyone just kind of gasped and waited to see what would happen next. And they're looking, and then finally Robert emerges from the deep, except he's face down and he's motionless. And so some oh. of Robert's friends who were on a boat below. They leapt into the water, they swam over to Robert they pulled him back to the boat they got him up on the deck and when they yeah his ribs are like powder now looked at him he looked awful <clears throat> there was blood coming out of his mouth he was barely conscious and he would just say to them did I make a good jump and then he would die an autopsy would reveal that Robert's impact with the surface of the water had oh. basically obliterated all of his insides amongst other oh. things his liver his spleen and both his kidneys had ruptured and oh. all of the ribs on his right side were broken a year later oh. another bridge jumper named Larry Donovan would make the jump off of the Brooklyn Bridge and survive setting the record for the highest bridge jump at the time. Oh, that's so sad, dude. Someone one-upped him. Oh, man. Come on, dude. That's kind of that's kind of mean, bro. <laughs> what, you're going to die? Well, I'm just going to do it and not die. Get fucked, kid. Oh. In 1978, 49-year-old Georgi Markov, who was originally from Bulgaria, was living in London and working as a reporter for the British Broadcasting Company, or BBC. Easy peasy. Georgi had moved to London six years earlier, and in the early days of him being in the UK, he would always take a cab Imagine or a bus time. to work. But over the last couple of years, he had taken to walking to work. Not only was it great exercise, but he also just loved the scenery. In particular, he liked on his commute to stop on the Waterloo Bridge, this very famous bridge in London, where from that Why position, this guy doing he had bridges? a beautiful view of the Westminster Palace on one side, and he had the iconic London Eye on the other, which is a very famous Ferris wheel. So on the Imagine morning of September 7th of that year, <clears throat> Georgie got up and he left his flat and he began his typical commute commute into work. However, by the time he reached the Waterloo Bridge and was getting ready to take in the sights, it had started to rain and Georgie did not have an umbrella. And so instead of sightseeing, he just kept on walking as quickly as he could to try to get to his office before he got completely soaked. How much of the video did you miss? You just missed the first story. We just started the second one.
soaked, but by the time he was just on the other side of the Waterloo Bridge and still had quite a distance to cover to get to work, the skies had completely opened up, and so as much as Georgie wanted to walk, because this was something he really enjoyed, he decided it was not worth it, and so he began looking for a bus stop, and he found one pretty quickly, and he rushed over to it. There was an awning that the commuters could stand underneath, and so he ran underneath this awning, getting out from under the rain, and... Okay, that's one thing I'm happy about that I don't live in a city is public transportation. I mean, Ubers, uh, like, okay, I'd probably use Uber more, but like buses and subways and stuff, gross. I, when I went to, when I went on a little vacation with my family to New York and we took a subway, gross. Gross. How do you guys do that? And then he proceeded to wait Gross. for the next bus to take him the rest of the way. As he stood there waiting, he suddenly felt a shooting pain in the back of his right thigh. And instinctively, without even knowing what it was, he just reached it's down and free grabbed entertainment. his leg. But he couldn't feel anything. And then he tried to kind of look around and look down at his leg. But it was just too crowded around him, so he really couldn't do it. And so he's standing there puzzled, still grabbing he got his stabbed. leg, wondering what could have caused this pain. And the only things he could think of were, you know, maybe someone near him had a pen or a pencil out and they accidentally poked him or maybe it's some sort of bug that bit him a spider or mm. a bee or something he didn't know but there weren't that many scenarios that made sense to him but before he could spend very much time dwelling on what had caused this the bus arrived and georgie turned around he hopped on board and by the time the bus pulled up in front of his office building and he had gone through the doors of the bbc georgie had effectively forgotten about this pain in his leg but Dude, what, I imagine there's literally, yeah, it could be like a needle. Actually, that's true. I wonder if someone stuck him with like a, a diseased needle or something. Like what, yeah, what if he just had something sticking out of his leg and he's too lazy to just turn around and look? But when he got up to his actual desk and <clears throat> sat down on his chair, when the underside of his thigh made contact with his chair, oh, it no! sent that shooting pain into his leg and immediately oh! he noticed it. It was almost like he had a splinter stuck in the back of his thigh and by pressing it down on the seat, Why didn't driving you look? that splinter deeper into his leg. And so Georgie stood up immediately and he's grabbing at the back of his leg and he's kind of craning his head to look down at the back of his leg, but you know, he doesn't see anything there. And so he's standing there wondering what he should do. He's got a really busy what? day ahead of him and he's he's thinking you know should i maybe go to the bathroom and see what this is but then he tells himself you're overthinking it this has got to be something minor you know i need to get to work and so he famous sat back last down words in his chair being very careful with his right leg when he placed it down so as not to press too hard on the spot that hurt and then he just got to work and over the course of several hours even though he knew there was kind of a dull aching pain in the back of his leg he mostly forgot about it he was just doing his job but by the second half of the day in the early afternoon the pain in his leg had become so excruciating that georgie was literally gritting georgie his overthinking a sharp pain in your leg is not overthinking profusely in order to try to ignore the pain but at some point it just became too much he couldn't focus on work and so he stood up he left his desk and he walked down the hall and he went into the single stall bathroom and once he went inside and he shut the door behind him he pulled his pants down and turned around and looked in the mirror to use the reflection to look at the back of his leg and right away there was a little bit of a relief there Ooh, because what he saw hurt. was thank you mr crab shiny ass for the resub a little bit of redness a little bit of swelling but nothing significant it looked very much like someone must have hit him with a pencil by accident or... okay so he probably had a little needle or something stick his leg and when he sat down it seeped all the way inside of his leg so he can't see it anymore that's gotta or be maybe it was a bee sting or a spider bite or something but whatever it was it was definitely minor at least in georgie's mind and so he pulls his pants back that's up, gotta be shirt back in he leaves the bathroom and goes back to his <clears> desk and then he sits down and despite this intense pain in his leg he's convinced himself it's no big deal and so he just kind of grits his way through the rest a of wood his workday. Chip? when he finally got home I again and walked through the door georgie's wife looked at him and was like what's wrong with you he was so pale he was sweating profusely Profusely, he looked awful and so he told her about what had happened with his leg and he was still trying to kind of write it off but she told him georgie you are sick there's something wrong we have to go to the hospital right now and so at this point georgie was miserable and so he agreed to go dude i know he's gonna die but like god damn 
that's such a if he actually does die i feel like he's gonna because normally these these things they always die but like come on i i hate the dumb alpha male mentality oh uh, you know like you know dudes who never go to the doctor I mean, I get it when you don't go to the doctor or, like, don't check things out with yourself because you don't want to pay for it. That makes sense. But when you don't go to the doctor because you're just like, oh, I can handle it. Yeah, I ain't a pussy. I can handle this shit. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many dudes out there like that. Like, quit being a... Stop! <laughs> stop being stupid! <laughs> what do you think of a beta going to a doctor? He's going to put his hands on me. Ew. And so the pair, they made their way over to the emergency room at the hospital. I don't go to the doctor go because inside, of a pussy. A Fair enough. pulled Georgie into an exam room and said... No, I, I get the anxiety portion, chat. I get anxiety too. I hate going to the doctor. But if I have something like that happening to me, I'm fucking going. All right? Like, if... Like, come on. If I'm profusely sweating because of a pain in my leg, I'm going. You call the ambulance after being shot, pussy? Just, just rub some dirt in it. Okay, you know, tell me what's going on. Why are you here? And Georgie would explain how in his morning commute, he had stopped at this bus stop and then felt this shooting pain. And then he told the doctor, you know, I'm pretty convinced this is someone who might have accidentally jabbed me with a pen or a pencil or accidentally a, bite, a spider bite. I don't know what it is, but I'm convinced it's something minor. And so the doctor, he hears this and he asks Georgie to stand up, pull his pants down so the doctor can get a look at the Yeah, site. it's got to be and a so needle. Georgie does. He gets up, he drops his pants. And then as the doctor bends down and begins looking at the back of his thigh, Georgie kind of turns around and looks down. Thank you, Jojo, for the tier one. And Welcome. he's shocked at what he sees. Even though he does not have a full view of the back of his leg, it's obvious that the swelling and redness on the back of his leg has grown exponentially. How it looks totally horrible. And so after a couple of minutes of oh. the doctor looking at the back of his leg, the doctor stands up and looks puzzled and tells Georgie, hold on a minute, I need somebody else to get a look at this. And so the doctor goes out into the main hall. He comes back with another doctor. Doctor, and that doctor comes over he bends down and he looks at the back of Georgie's leg as well and after the two of them kind of talk to each other and they're looking at the back of his leg they stand up and they walk around and they're facing Georgie now and they say okay this is gonna sound totally weird but when you were at the bus stop before you felt the pain in your leg was anyone around you holding a snake or a reptile Okay, uh, as that was a, probably the furthest thing from what I actually thought it was going to be. Well, I know that sounds crazy, but the mark on the back of your leg looks exactly like a venomous bite. So Georgie's like, no, I didn't see anyone with snakes or reptiles. There was nothing out of the ordinary about what was happening around me when I felt this pain in my leg. We were all just standing there and then I felt it in my leg. That was it. And so the doctors would tell Georgie that, you know, they didn't really know what was going on with his leg. And so the best thing to do here is just to admit him to the hospital and monitor him and, you know, try to run some tests on him and try to make him comfortable. And it so was that an night, assassin. Georgie was admitted to the hospital. He was set up in his own hospital room and right Away, I keep a snake with me at all times for protection. Dude, let's get rid of guns, normalize snakes. You know what I mean? Like, have like a snake coiled up right here, and whenever someone threatens you, just watch out, and it goes like, whoosh, 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 and like attacks you like that. You know what I mean? Pocket snake. <laughs> watch out! It's like, it curls around your arm and like, like springboards off of your arm and like <laughs> like attacks someone's throat that would be cool that would be cool
administering different combinations <clears throat> of medicines and treatments to try to lower the swelling and the pain in his leg. But it just seemed like nothing was working. And so all night, his condition seemed to get worse, not better. And then the next day when he woke up, his leg was much, much worse. It was extremely swollen. It almost looked like a balloon that had been completely filled. It was very red. And Georgie himself was also beginning to lose touch with reality. He had become convinced that someone had tried to kill him and that was why he was so sick. And this delusion of his got so extreme that he was afraid no, of his anti -venom? doctors and they, nurses. And so it became... The thing is, uh, the anti-venom, you need to know what snake. You know what I mean? Isn't that, isn't that how it is? Like anti-venom, if you don't know what the snake is, it doesn't... A big like it challenge work. trying to help him because he was effectively fighting them off. By the next day, Georgie's condition overall had become critical. He was very clearly on the brink of death and his mind was effectively gone. But the doctors and the nurses really had no idea what was going on with him and so there was nothing they could do to help him. And then on the last day he was in the hospital, the third day, Georgie would die. His body just shut down. Given the strangeness of Georgie's what the death, fuck? his body was sent for an autopsy <clears throat> to try to figure out what had caused that leg pain because that seemed to be the trigger that ultimately killed him. And sure enough, during the autopsy, the coroner made a surprising discovery. Buried in the back of his right leg, right underneath the site that was where he felt the pain was this little piece of metal it was so oh lead poisoning so small the coroner actually almost didn't see it but Cringe. when he thank you whole lot of 99 for the prime did see it he put it under the microscope and what he saw was this obviously man-made metallic disc that had these two small reservoirs drilled into it and so they sent this disc off for further testing and what they discovered was there was what? ricin residue inside of those two reservoirs ricin is an ricin? extremely powerful poison it is breaking what is this breaking bad shit this is an assassination this is an assassination. What the fuck? More lethal than cyanide, and it has no antidote. And the symptoms of ricin poisoning often look like the symptoms of other diseases <clears throat> or illnesses. And so it's that very difficult to diagnose. And so as a result of these factors, ricin is a very popular poison for assassinations. And the belief is that that is exactly what happened to Georgie. He was assassinated. But to His this wife day, we don't actually know who assassinated him. However, the running theory is that Georgie, who was a reporter for the BBC, he covered politics and he often spoke oh. very critically about the Soviet Union. And so this theory goes. Oh, it all comes full circle. The Russian government. Oh, no. That the Soviet Union's intelligence agency, known as the KGB, they assassinated Georgie for what he was writing about. Adding credence to this theory, a former KGB officer named Oleg Kaligan, who was exiled to the United States in 1991, he claimed that he oversaw the assassination program that targeted Georgi Markov. He said what they did is they put this little tiny disc, that metal disc with the ricin inside of it, they put that at the tip of an umbrella and they made sure the disc itself was fairly sharp. And then the KGB assassin with this umbrella simply followed Georgi on his typical morning commute. And then when he stopped at that bus stop, the assassin jabbed him in the back of the leg and then faded into the crowd. According to Oleg, those little metal metallic discs that had the ricin inside of them, they were actually covered with a thin layer of wax, and only when this disc had been placed inside of the target's body would their body heat melt that wax layer off, exposing the poison. Dude, what the hell? This is scary as shit. This, the, the fact that, that they have, like, assassins that are so good. Bruh. This is scary. They could kill anyone they want whenever they want and get Bruh. away with it. Bruh. 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 This is literally like like some spy Bruh. shit. Bruh. Bruh. No wonder people are paranoid. Bruh. Yeah. Holy shit. The Hitman games in real life, Bruh. yeah. 
the hell? And then their target would die. Wow. Don't take notes. As Georgie did. <clears throat> However, Oleg's story, despite being as compelling as it was, didn't have any hard proof to back it up. And so to this day, there has been no one officially charged with Georgie Markov's murder. Being a journalist is the most dangerous job out there. I feel like now it's everyone's a journalist. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, feel like, I, I guarantee back then, yeah, being a journalist is like, you got to watch your shit. But now, like, a everyone's a journalist. You know what I mean? But yeah, back then, oh God. In 2006, Imagine being exiled to the Sherman country you were meant to fight against the definition Lamau. of a man's man. He had spent the bulk of his yeah! adult life a doing Sigma. one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, mining for coal in West Virginia. And while he was a coal miner, yeah! he apparently had lost track of the amount of times he had nearly been killed from mine shaft collapse and gas leaks. Later on in life, after his kids had all grown up, he had retired from coal mining and become an ordained Baptist minister. And despite his harrowing backstory and burly, intimidating appearance, he was known to be incredibly gentle and very calming to his parishioners. He was also known to be an incredibly <clears throat> devoted grandfather to the point where some journalists go to jail still like that's still a thing. Well, I guess, I mean, obviously I guess in different countries, I mean, obviously America is different because free speech and stuff like that. I'm sure. Yeah. China. I actually yeah, had China and like, wasn't North Korea and Russia kind of, freaky too with like how strict they are where if there was a chance to spend time with his grandkids he would basically throw all of his responsibilities out the window in turkey that, that happens but in dude i'm so used to like the america bubble like i have i need to like learn some shit about different countries because i have no clue half the time i know china and russia are authoritarian i know that but yeah i, I don't know i don't know much about other politics and the sad part is it seems like even other countries know more about american politics than america does which is fucking hilarious and the reason they know so much about american politics is because it's entertaining as shit because it's always stupid like they're literally countries across like are all just laughing at us right now i mean yeah at least we're not authoritarian yeah there's that in January of that year, something changed in Sherman. He went from being this pillar in the community to being a deranged, it's like watching WWE lunatic. in politics. It all started on the wrestlers. afternoon of January 19th. Sherman and his wife Ruby were sitting in their home. Alone, yeah, I'll take some soup, hun. Alone on the couch, just kind of doing their own things. When suddenly, maybe out some of the crackers. Blue, Sherman just starts screaming as if he sees something in front of him that's terrifying him. And his scream startled Ruby Real so picture. that she started screaming. And so she looks at her husband, and he's still just looking straight out ahead. He's terrified of something in front of him. And so Ruby looks from him to where he's looking, and there's nothing there. And so she turns oh! back to. Oh no! I didn't mean to say. Oh. No, Ch I'm. Si I was actually being serious. I actually did want crackers with. I did. I actually did want c words with my soup. And that was that was that was literally a Freudian slip. I wasn't trying to. No, no, that w no. 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 Shut up. Shut up. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get banned. Cancelled and ratioed. No, please. To her husband, and she's like, what's going on? What are you screaming for? What are you so scared of? But Sherman wasn't able to speak. After he stopped screaming, he just continued to look straight out as if whatever had terrified him had him in this trance where he couldn't look away. And so his eyes are wide, his mouth is open, his face is going white, he's starting to sweat, and Ruby's starting to panic. She has no idea what's happening with him. And so eventually she just holds on to him and says, come back to me, come back to me. And Sherman at some point would, he kind of broke out of his trance and he looked at his wife and he just said, 
says, you can't leave me or they'll kill me. Ruby has never seen behavior like this in her Maka husband Giga. ever. This is a completely different person she's interacting with, and so she has no idea what to do. And so instead, she just kind of holds on to Sherman and prays that he doesn't start acting like that again. But that didn't happen. All day long, periodically, he would just start screaming about something that Ruby couldn't see. Now, Ruby did effects. consider calling 911 and getting medics out there, but his behavior was so unusual, and he was normally such a rock who was so competent, who was so healthy that she didn't want to. She felt like he would just kind of get through this, that if they can just get through today and get into tomorrow, that he would be better. And so she just all day was comforting him and just dealing with these episodes. And then finally, they got into bed that night, and Ruby Ruby's thinking, thank goodness. No, I I think I'll just do crackers and I, I'll do I'll do C words instead of butter bread. Just so I could dip them. Just so I could dip those C words. Damn it. We're gonna wake up tomorrow and things will be better. But when she woke up the next morning, it was very obvious Sherman had not slept at all. He was looking straight up at the ceiling. He looked worse than the day before. It was obvious that he was not back to normal. And so Ruby Cut called the, the rest of the family and I'll had them the come bod. over to figure out what they were going to do. But when Sherman found out his family was coming to his house, he told Ruby they can't come inside. He was afraid they and others were conspiring to bury him alive. The only person he could be around was Ruby and his whole family had no idea what to do. Little did they know, there was actually a very specific reason he was acting the way he was. PTSD? A few months before January 19th, which was the day Sherman turned into this different person, a few months earlier, he began complaining of severe abdominal pains. And so he and his wife Ruby and his daughter, they went to the Everyone hospital. Everyone has C-words, but they're so... But when him I say C-words... ...determined that most likely his pain was coming from his gallbladder. But the only only way to be sure would be to do some exploratory surgery and literally look inside of Sherman's gut and look at his gallbladder and see if that was the problem. And so the doctor asked Sherman, you know, are you prepared he to do an smile exploratory bug surgery or would you like to just kind of wait it out and see what happens with this pain? And so Sherman talked it over with his wife and his family and they made the decision that the pain was just too much and so they would go forward with the surgery. And so on the morning of January 19th, so again, did they leave something inside of him? I wonder if that's one of those cases where they like left a tool inside and this of his body. the day that Sherman basically <laughs> loses his mind. He goes into the hospital completely normal. He goes in with his wife. He goes in with his daughter. And he makes his way over to the surgery wing of the hospital. He says bye to his family. And he's put on a stretcher bed. And he's wheeled in and prepped for surgery. And then brought into the operating room. And while he was in the operating room, laying on his stretcher bed, flat on his back, looking straight. Oh no! Oh no! It the anesthe the anesthesia didn't work. I bet he had an anesthesia coma, where where he couldn't move, but he could feel everything. Dude, that is one of my greatest fears. I'm not gonna lie. That's one of like my biggest fears. I've been put under before when I was younger and I had uh, appendicitis. Straight up at all these bright lights above him, he just struck up some chit chat with the nurses and doctors who were in the room prepping the room for surgery and they were also putting the IV into his arm. Then at some point, one of the nurses lowered the oxygen mask onto Sherman's face so the anesthesiologist could administer the two drug cocktail that would knock him out for the surgery. Sherman was scheduled to get something known as general anesthesia for this operation where basically he would be completely out, he wouldn't feel oh, anything, no. they'd do the surgery and then he would wake up and it's called anesthesia awareness i thought it was like something with a coma recovery. but and so once this mask was on sherman's face the anesthesiologist began pumping him full of the drugs that would make him be knocked out for the surgery however the anesthesiologist only administered one of the two drugs necessary oh no Dude, this is literally like one of my like greatest fears. Oh God. 
don't like wouldn't you think there'd be some sort of like check mark system fail safe i guess i mean this is probably that's probably a while ago but. for general anesthesia he administered the paralyzing drug but he did not administer the actual anesthetic that would knock him out and most importantly would get rid of all of his pain and so after Thank you, Corka Kitty, for the for the resub. As this mask is on his face and Sherman believes he's being given the proper dosage of drugs, the nurse who was nearby told Sherman to go ahead and start counting backwards in his head from 10, knowing full well that Sherman would pass out before he reached zero. And Sherman knew this too. He had been in surgery before, and so he happily began counting in his head. 10, 9, 8, he started to feel something. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Boom, he was out except he wasn't. When he reached zero in his head, counting down, he realized he had not passed out. He began taking mental stock of what was going on, and he realized he could completely feel his body, but when he tried to move his body, he couldn't. He was completely paralyzed. Oh, when he tried my. to make a sound, he couldn't, because his vocal cords oh, were also- Oh my God, I can't. I can't. Oh, I don't, I don't, I, this is hard to listen to. This is, this is tough. It's, when I did my C-section, I had to tell them I could still feel down there. Yeah, I remember that. This is literally like the, I'm pretty sure this is actually like the most torturous thing you could possibly go through paralyzed the only thing he could move were his eyes he could move them left and right however they had taped his eyes shut so he can't see why oh 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 i was thinking oh maybe like they would be able to oh they don't dry out okay yeah but couldn't you just do that like if, if if he fell asleep and his eyes were open couldn't you just like do one of these numbers and just push his eyelid eyelids closed see anything and so sherman is thinking to himself okay you know i've been given the drugs maybe they're slow acting any minute now i'm gonna drift off to sleep and this will just be a distant memory but after a few seconds he's hearing the doctors and nurses in the room he can't see them but he hears them they seem to be moving towards doing this operation and he's still awake and so sherman becomes frantic and starts flicking his eyes left and right as fast as he possibly can and the rapid eye movement actually loosened the tape on both of his eyelids and it created a tiny slit that he could actually look through and what he saw terrified him the surgeon was walking over next to him he was getting his gloves on and then the surgeon says scalpel and the nurse hands him this chrome metallic blade and the surgeon takes the blade and begins cutting into sherman's midsection sherman felt everything but sherman couldn't do anything about it all he could do was rapidly flick his eyes left and right in hopes one of them would see that he was awake that he was feeling this but no one was paying attention to his face so they didn't see his eyes moving around and so the surgeon continued to cut into his midsection until oh! he had cut out a fairly significantly sized hole at which point the surgeon hands the scalpel to the nurse and says clamps at which point the nurse yeah i i can't I can't. I can't. Oh, just, oh. You know, they have to say first incision and see if he can feel it. Like, what? I'm pretty, okay, I feel like this is probably, like, the case that made it where they take it seriously now. Because, you know, every time... Like, all the fail-safes of everything end up coming from something. And I feel like this is where it came from. Yeah, the heart rate. Like, anything. Like, this is, like, I feel like nowadays, it's, like, unheard of for this to happen nowadays. Like, you know, I, I don't I don't think this happens, like, at all anymore. Because, you know, they're, they are sm not smarter. I mean, I guess, yeah, smarter now. But they take more precautions than they used to.
That's like this, hmm, debatable. All right, let me check. Anesthesia awareness occurs infrequently and the duration and severity vary. Patients may or may not feel pain. Some patients experience a feeling of pressure. It has been estimated that roughly one patient per thousand receiving general anesthesia experiences some level of awareness, usually fleeting. Several studies put the inc incidence of anesthesia awareness at a 0.1% of all general anesthesia patients. 21,000 of the 21 million people in the U.S. who get general anesthesia in a typical year. Okay. Still happens. But, but, I'm talking about uh, errors of the doctor themselves. Because I feel like anesthesia awareness happens, but, it, but like the pain element isn't there. You know, like he felt. I feel like the, I'm talking about like, like the doctor... Uh, fuck up element. I hate numbers like one in 1,000. It makes it sound so much more common than 0.01%. I know, right? But it does make me feel better that I've already dealt with anesthesia. And uh, my dad was awake during his wisdom teeth um, and wasn't supposed to be. Yeah, that happens to some people. I feel like that happens a lot. But at least that's just teeth. A lot, because a lot of people say they feel uh, pressure when it happens, but they don't like actually feel pain. You don't hear about the screw ups because of settlements. You walk out with 500k in silence, 500k and PTSD. This hands him what looks like a tor yeah. I it does make me feel better though that I've I've had anesthesia before and and I was like out so. I hopefully I'll Butcher never device, have to deal with this. And the surgeon proceeds to use these clamps to pin segments of Sherman's skin that has just been cut open to his body to basically keep the hole open. And then the surgeon began tugging on the outsides of this hole in Sherman's midsection, making sure it was big enough that he could actually get a good look into his body. And every little tug is sending lightning bolts of pain into Sherman's body. But again, all he can do is flick his eyes left and right, and no one's paying attention. Scope, the surgeon called out for, and the nurse handed him a camera that he jammed into Sherman's gut. Dude, I, I, I literally, I, I can't. I got, I, I'm about to skip, dude. I'm about to fucking skip. I'm about to skip. And then the surgeon said suction and the nurse got what looked like a vacuum and pressed it inside of this open wound and began sucking out fluids from his body. The pain Sherman was experiencing is unimaginable. Every second felt like an eternity. Forceps, the surgeon called and the nurse handed him these metal prongs that he put inside of this hole in Sherman's body and he used them to dislodge his gallbladder so he could get a better look at it. By this point, Sherman wanted to die. He was no longer flicking his eyes left wouldn't he have passed out from pain at that point? Like, wouldn't he have passed out? Like, dear God. And right. He was just looking straight out, hoping someone would finally see him. And someone did. One of the nurses standing next to the surgeon looked up at Sherman's face and saw Sherman looking back, terrified at the nurse, at which point the nurse yelled out, stop, he's awake, he's awake. And the surgeon practically faints and he looks over at the anesthesiologist and he calls him, get over here and fix this. And so the anesthesiologist comes running over from the side of the room. He gets up next to Sherman and begins pumping him full of painkillers. And as he's doing this, he has this moment of clarity. He remembers he didn't give him the anesthetic. And so as these new painkillers that have just been introduced begin to take their effect, Sherman's eyes go from being terrified to glazed over and he does pass off to sleep. And so now he's out and he can't feel anything. But now the uh, anesthesiologist and the medical team realize they have a very big problem. Yeah, he's like, oh fuck, I'm fired. <laughs> Bruh. That, the sad part is that was probably his first thought. Like, th dude, think about this. Like, making a mistake as an anesthesi anesthesiologist is giving someone literally the worst pain and imaginable. Giving someone torture. You know, that's just like forgetting pickles on, on a burger at McDonald's. It's like a mistake like that. But a mistake like that for an anesthesiologist would literally ruin someone's life.
This patient just experienced 16 minutes of surgery and felt all of it. And at the end of it, when he wakes up, he's going to remember it, and he's probably going to file a lawsuit against the hospital. And so a decision was made. It's unclear if the anesthesiologist acted alone or if the entire team was in on no this. No way. But regardless, the anesthesiologist no administered an additional drug after giving all these painkillers. This additional drug was called midazolam, but it's better known as the amnesia drug and like it no way no fucking way wow wow its nickname implies anyone who gets it will forget what has just happened to them. And so the idea was by giving him this amnesia drug, he won't remember the trauma he had suffered through during the surgery and so wouldn't file a lawsuit. And so after he was given this drug, the medical team, they went back to doing the surgery, they completed it and they got him back out to recovery. And then the sad part is, I feel like if they didn't do that, like sure, they'd get sued. But, like, he could at least get proper mental help to, like, at least deal with his PTSD. I don't know. I wouldn't want to remember that shit. But you're going... The thing is, what is going to happen is that they give him the anesthesiology drug. He will have the prolonged effects of PTSD, but he won't know why. He won't know why he's afraid. He won't, he, like, what happened to him. He started hallucinating and he started screaming out of nowhere and freaking out because he, he doesn't know why or what's happening. His brain is still dealing with the trauma, yeah, in his subconscious, but he doesn't know why he's dealing with trauma. So that just makes it 10 times worse. At least if he had the trauma himself, and he knew where it came from, he at least could get help. You know? All right, one second. I got to go get my soup. I don't, I don't know how I'm going to be able to eat after this, but I'm going to go try. Then when Sherman woke up in recovery, he did not remember what had happened to him inside of the operating room, at least not consciously. Those horrible 16 minutes I have told been you. implanted on Sherman's I told subconscious. You. Basically, his body recognized that he had experienced extreme trauma. However, the amnesia drug wiped away the memory of how he received that trauma. So there's this big disconnect in his memory. And so when Sherman came to in the recovery room, he immediately sensed something was horribly, horribly wrong. He was scared. He was anxious. He had this incredible sense of dread, but he had no memory to tie these feelings to. And so as yep. Sherman is sitting in recovery, he must have tried to kind of hide the way he was feeling because he didn't even remotely understand it. He had been completely happy happy and normal going into the surgery and now a couple of hours later he's a complete mess and so he leaves yeah, the hospital doctors, that day dude. on january 19th he goes back to his house and he sits on the couch with his wife and as he's sitting there suddenly these horrible feelings he's having they become too much and he basically has a panic attack and he starts screaming out and he's terrified of something but he doesn't know what it is and then over the next couple of days he began having these flashbacks where he would access the actual 16 minutes of torture he went through but when he would see someone cutting into him and opening his chest up and sucking things out of it he didn't think that happened to me and that's why i feel this he way forgot. instead he thought it was just this horrible nightmare that he couldn't escape from and so his family did eventually start getting doctors and psychologists and all these people involved to figure out what was wrong with him but before they could figure it out the whole situation had just become too terrible for sherman and so on february no. 2nd just no. two weeks after he came out of no. that surgery he, didn't, he would take no. his own life. His wow. How do you live with yourself? being those doctors. How do you live with yourself?
family was unbelievably heartbroken. It didn't seem real that this had happened. Mm -hmm. And so they would continue to dig and dig and figure out what went wrong. And they would finally get their hands on the medical report from the gallbladder exploratory surgery on January 19th. And after giving it to another doctor to look over, this doctor discovered that Sherman had in fact experienced 16 minutes of something known as anesthesia awareness, where you are awake or feel a portion of your surgery. And shockingly, this happens to 20,000 people a year. However, Sherman's case, forgetting the amnesia drug, just literally what he went through, Don't hit 16 me with that. full minutes of this really intensive surgery that he felt, that is an absolute rarity. That does not happen very often. Sherman's family would go on to sue the hospital and they would be awarded an undisclosed amount of money from the hospital in 2008. So that's gonna- It better be a big ass amount of money. Now it's time to walk away. I hope you enjoyed your stay. Did you laugh or cry or maybe subscribed? I'll thank you either way. You know I will miss you. I hope you return. Tell your friend or your mother to get me more views, please.